Well, good morning, church. How are we doing today? Now, if you don't uh, know who I am, I'm Kirk Buckner. I'm uh, the executive pastor here. Uh, Our lead pastor, Spencer Dunlap, has been off doing science experiments for the last two weeks. See, most of you know him. I think that's funny. It probably was. No, actually, uh, a week before last, just kind of give you a little insight, just things that that happens in the life of pastors. You know, we're a church planting church, which just means that we were a church plant And we believe in church plants. And so he spends a lot of time going out and helping other church planters, whether he has to actually go away or on the phone, uh, just just giving them, uh, you know, just advice and and, and pictures of what it's like to plant a church and how to to really, you know, grow in that. Uh, And so he did that a week before last. And this last week he did something I think is really important that you know that that we have to do uh, as pastors. Because you often think that what we do, you know, we spend our life, you know, kind of everything's about God and the kingdom of God and our whole, everything we do about uh, every day is like that. Except we have to be very deliberate about spending time with God, about moving towards God, about hearing from God. And that's a day-to-day thing. And he got a chance and opportunity to go away and kind of hide himself away in a cabin to spend time with God. And it's a a picture that has to happen because for us, we have to be poured into by God so that we can do our ministry job. We have an actual role and a job to do that we're called to do every week. And so you can ask him about that when you see him. He's here today, and and I'm sure he gave you a hug on the way in. If you missed your hug, then uh, you can get it on the way out. But I'm sure he'd be glad to tell you kind of what that's like and what, what we have to do and all that. But it's kind of part of this picture of, of what we're doing, this theme this year. I'm trying to finish up this part of the sermon series on the theme of live, this idea that we're called to live a life, right? And, and if you look at Ephesians 4.1, this kind of backs up. This is the, the anchor verse for the year. Now, some of your version, this is the one that like kind of is on the logo, this idea of, of, of you're, you're kind of living a life worthy, right? And then some of your, ver- uh, your translations might say that walk in a manner worthy, and I talked about last week, the picture of that is really beautiful, this idea that we, when we walk, we walk deliberately. We're walking in a certain way. We don't walk and we just wander, that whole GPS thing where it's like recalculating. Remember, that's like you, you, the, the idea that we walk deliberately, and, and the Holy Spirit's really great about painting a picture for us that shows that, and reinforced by John 14, 6. Right? In John 14, 6, you know, when Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, the way, the Greek word is hodos, it actually means path or road. And what do you do on a path or road? Well, you walk on it, right? And so he's, he's really given us a clear picture of what that looks like. And so we've spent a lot of time in Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, 1 being the anchor verse. Uh, Ephesians 4, 20 to 20 to 4 is where I left off last week. And you know, when we kind of teach and we talk about things, sometimes we, we really pick apart uh, a certain part of Scripture or a verse, we kind of sometimes go back into the Greek because the Greek gives us a good picture, right? It tells us, uh, it paints the bigger portrait of what God tr- is trying to tell us. And so the part I left off with last week, I talked about the truth being in Jesus. That was that reference to John fourteen six. But the idea that, that I, qu- the question that I asked you was, were you taught to walk in the ways of Jesus? Have you been taught as you've come to church in the ways uh, to walk in Jesus? And, and, and where I left that off was just a kind of a question to think about that because the Bible tells us we should be clearly taught this, that we should taught to, to walk in the ways of Jesus. Colossians 2, 6 through 7 really kind of outlines this for us. It's the same really uh, kind of phraseology that you'll see in Ephesians 4.20, but it's, this is what it says. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord... So walk in him, so live in him. That's the peripateo word, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So you understand that, you know, back in, when this is written to the early church, that teaching was, was the primary way. You had a teacher. Even they coming from the, the Jews coming from the, from, from the history of the rabbinical uh, the way, the way they were taught by rabbis was to travel around and listen to him teach. And so they had, you know, they had the Old Testament, what we know as the Old Testament today, but they didn't really have the canon of Scripture. The, the Bibles, we take for granted that we have the Bible. They had letters that might have been circulated to the churches or different types of writings, but they didn't really have Bibles to hand out. And so they were taught. And the, in a way across the world right now, you see that they're taught because the underground church in China doesn't have a lot of Bibles. Having a Bible could mean you would be sentenced to death. Right? And so they, they're being taught by, by people that come in, they're either missionaries or the, that, that teach other people or disciples. And, and so this idea that, that we are equipped is the big picture, that God equips us, what, with people that can teach the Bible and different gifts, this body of Christ. Remember we talked about Ephesians 4.11 last week, that God gifts the church, the body of Christ, 
with all types of things so that we would operate to do what? To, to, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, to build up the body of Christ, to attain the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ, to be more Christ-like. And so we get this, right? And then now we do have the Bible. Isn't that great? I mean, in the Western church, I, you know, I probably have like 10 of these at home. That's great. Isn't it great? They can put it, I can put it on a lampstand. No, no, no. We have the ability to study the Bible. We have the Word of God with us. And what's even greater than that, God equips the church. He gives us His Word. And then He's done something just amazing is that the Holy Spirit's inside of us. And the Holy Spirit is to teach us. That's one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit. Look at John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things. And bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Holy Spirit points the way to Jesus. He teaches these things. And so we are equipped to know more about Jesus. And that part of Ephesians 4, 20 through 24, the, about verse 22, is telling us something that we should be taught what? That we should put off our old self and put on our new self. What does this mean? And where do we get this and where does it come from? So it says in verse 22, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. The Bible's telling us that we have this old self, a former manner of life full of deceitful desires. It's corrupt with deceitful desires. Well, what does deceitful word? Deceitful is a synonym for lie, right? Where do lies come from? What is the source of lies and untruth? Well, it comes from the devil, it comes from our enemy. We look in the Genesis, the very first, the very first lie was in the garden, right? God's holding out on you, right? If you will eat the fruit from this tree, your eyes will be open, you'll be like God. He didn't really say don't eat that anyway. It's like these are the kind of things get us to you know, believe in something that's not true. This deception, this former manner of life, this is the old self. Well, what are we supposed to do? with the old self. Well, we're supposed to put away or put off the old self. The Greek word is epithemy, and it means to put away, to lay down, to lay aside. It, it, if you get the visual, what it really means is like to take something off of you and to throw it down. Take it off. It's on you. Take it off of you and throw it down. Now, I don't know if any of you are afraid of spiders, but someone in my, my household is really afraid of spiders, and so if spider got on that person or my household, they would freak out, and they want that off of them, and so I get a clear picture of what it means to, like, really want something off of them, kind of like, ah, boom. Nobody's afraid of spiders in here, are they? Okay, good. There's no fear in Jesus, right? We just sing that song. Okay. Let's look at this put away. There's clearly a, an outline of what the picture of the Bible is trying to give you. Look at, look at Ephesians 4.25. Put off falsehood. Romans 13.12. Lay aside the works of darkness. Colossians 3.8. Put away those things. What things? Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy talk from your mouth. Anybody have a problem with filthy talk? Don't raise your hands. Okay, good. Hebrews 12.1. This is the anchor verse of our running the race discipleship class we have coming up. And I'm going to read the whole thing because it gives a good picture. Since we ourselves have such a great cloud of witness surrounding us, let us also lay aside, put off, take off every impediment and the sin that so easily distracts and let us run with endurance the race that is prescribed before us. This idea that, that there are impediments, which means roadblocks. There are things in our way and we should put them off and get them out of our way and also sin. These aren't synonymous, they're not the same things. They're saying there are things in our way that keep us from getting to Jesus, and there's also sin, and we need to throw all of that stuff off of us and move away from it. James 1.21, put aside all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. 1 Peter 2.1, therefore having put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander of every kind. What picture does this paint? What do we see here? Well, think about last week we talked about the chamber pot. And if you, if you weren't here last week, you understand like a chamber pot is something that looks really ornate on the outside. It's, it's a beautiful piece of, of pottery, but what was it used for? Well, unclean purposes, right? That you put it under the bed and it was cold in the wintertime. You couldn't make it to the outside outhouse. This is before indoor plumbing. Yes, kids, there were a time when we didn't have toilets in the house. Before indoor plumbing, the chamber pot would be used. Well, this idea that, that when you get the picture of this, that there's some stuff inside this chamber pot that's not quite right. It's not really good stuff. And then sometimes if you were to carry that chamber pot and you tripped and fell, you might spill it on someone, 
We talked about last week that, yes, you could get some of that spilled on even in church. And what does that stuff that gets spilled on you look like? Well, if you look at these Bible verses, some of it could look like anger or rage or malice or slander or filthy talk or deceit or envy. I wrote in my notes right there, this is what poo looks like. This is the yucky stuff that comes out of us sometimes, that we have this stuff that still is not being changed or hasn't been transformed by Christ. And why? Because we come from a place that's not quite right, that has filthiness and corruption and rampant wickedness. That's the place that we come from when we're in the other kingdom before we move to God's kingdom. And so you have to understand, and I just want to caution you as we talk about this, that it's, this is not behavior management, right? I know some of you grew up in church, and church was about do's and don'ts, right? It was like, don't do this, don't talk like this, but do this, act like this. This is how you're supposed to act. This was what church was, but this is not what, if you leave it right here, it's going to sound a lot like, don't do this, and then we're going to do this. That's not the way it works. You'll see the full picture, so bear with me as we move through this. But you have this idea that what's happening here, and it ties it in together beautifully, is that we're supposed to be renewed. We're supposed to put off the old self and we're supposed to be renewed. Let's look at Ephesians 4.22, really 4.23, and it says this, like, put off your old self and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And in other places, you'll see this, Romans 12.2, which is the anchor verse in the founding of Renew Community Church. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. It's on artwork in the lobby in case you missed it. So this is something that has been foundational to to Renew Community Church. Colossians 3.10 creates a great picture. Put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. I just want to stop for a minute because it creates such a beautiful picture. You understand that if you read the Bible and you look in the back and you kind of go to Revelation, you go back to the other in the Old Testament to Daniel and the prophecies and uh, Ezekiel, and you start to see what's happening as we march towards the end of this age, that Jesus is going to come back and make all things new. He's not going to make all new things. He's going to renew things. He's going to make all things new. That's clearly what the Bible has given us a picture of. And guess where it starts? Right? He'll come back at some point and make all things new, but where does it start? Well, it starts in us, his church, his body, being renewed back to the image of its creator. Remember in Genesis, we're created in the image of God. And so the work that's being done now as we march towards this new kingdom right, is being done within the body, the church, us. It's a beautiful picture of what God is doing. And so when we look at this idea, that was the old self. We tie the old self and we're being renewed by putting on the new self. Well, what's the new self? Ephesians 4, 24 lays this out. Put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The likeness of God. This is the new self. What is the new self? It's, it's Jesus. It's the new self. And, and what it really means, that the idea of putting it on is, is in duo, it means to clothe yourself, whereas to put off, it means to like to take this thing off and like literally like throw it away. We're supposed to clothe ourselves in something. We're supposed to put it on like a garment, like maybe perhaps a righteous robe, if you will. Now let's look at the different parts in the Bible. It talks about putting on something. Ephesians 6, 11, put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Galatians 3.27, For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Romans 13.12, Put on the armor of light. Romans 13.14, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 3.10, Put on the new man. Colossians 3.12, Clothe yourselves with heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. 1 Thessalonians 5.8, Put on the breastplate of faith and love and as the helmet, the hope of salvation. What do we see when we look at that body of this idea of this thing of putting on something, of clothing ourselves with something? Well, the first thing is you start to see the character of Jesus. As you read the Bible and you see Jesus walk this earth, what you see, this is the kind of things, the character that he showed. This was his personality. This is just how he was. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. True righteousness and holiness, that is Jesus. And it points to Jesus, the idea that we're being renewed, right? Renewed for what? To be like Christ. This is what we're seeing as the picture. But the last part, and you might miss, if you miss this part, it's a really great looking picture, but it's this idea of armor. 
Notice the three places it talks about armor. Ephesians 6.11, Romans 13.12, 1 Thessalonians 5.8. That we're supposed to put on this armor. And what happens? Do we put on armor to go shopping or go to eat dinner? What do we put on armor for? You might say it? Come on, audience participation. What about battle? Battle! Right? Battle, right? If we, have, if we have battle, we would put on armor. So Lo said that, that in these three places we have, we're supposed to put on armor, put on the armor of light, put on the full armor of God, put on the breastplate of faith and love, the helmet of hope and salvation. So I, I think you get this picture when you combine it all together. When you put on Jesus, you put on armor. Did you get that? When you put on Jesus, you put on armor. Armor is not a separate thing. It's when you clothe yourself in Christ Jesus, you're putting on armor, which is to stand against the enemy. And understand, I, I, I taught on this last year, this, this idea of armor of God. The stand against is not to like do this and you know, take you know, headshots by, by the enemy. It's to firmly stand against as you're leaning against and opposing the enemy. That's the armor of God because that's what Jesus does for us when we put him on. This is is the picture. And what I'm trying to do is paint a, a bigger portrait for you of what, it, what this is all like. How does it all come together, this old self and new self and maybe confused? Well, I'm trying to give you a visual image of how this works. Well, first of all, I'm going to set up a visual image of the kingdom of God, and it's going to be very rudimentary, but, but uh, follow along with me. I'm going to get this chair and put it over here. But the kingdom of God and, and how that works is you have, obviously... I'm going to call this the throne room, and we're going to kind of have this in the kingdom. But we'll just so you know that which kingdom we're talking about, the Word of God and um, the Word of God, right? The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. This is Jesus, the Word of God, author of life. Great kingdom of God right here. We'll call this the kingdom of God. And then there's going to be a line that I'm going to create, try to create a visual line for you here, of this idea that we have, um, we have the kingdom of God. Let's see if I can make this work. You can see the line. Yep. That we have two kingdoms. Now, the Bible makes this pretty clear, okay? There is uh, what we call the domain of darkness, and we call the kingdom of God. There is no neutral kingdom. The Bible makes that very clear. There's no neutral kingdom. We there's no gray area kingdom that you're either in the domain of darkness that's controlled by the devil and the enemy. Or you're in the kingdom of God. And there's really no you know, skipping back and forth. We don't get to do that. We don't get to sit here. We're in one or the other. And this, this domain of darkness, where we all once were, right? This domain of darkness has a lot of stuff to it. You remember that corrupt and wickedness and filthiness that was described in the former way of life? Well, it kind of looks like this. Chains. We're bound by this. Clearly bound. This filthiness, this wickedness, this domain of darkness that we have here. And you have to understand, you know, the Bible gives a description that, that, that even the good things we do over here are like filthy rags compared to the righteousness of Christ. Now, don't get stopped there that, that if, 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 if you are, are over here to hear this pastor, the first time I've come here, say that, well, he called me a filthy rag, I'm never coming back. Understand what this is saying, Okay. Bear with me here a little bit. What we do over here in this domain of darkness, we are captured by sin. And every time you read the Bible, you're going to see a lot of times when it says sin, it'll say sin and death, sin and death. Life here in this kingdom is guaranteed for death and not eternal life with Christ Jesus. You can't, you can't attain it. You can't move it. You can't take these chains off by any effort that you do on yourself. You just can't do it. The Israelites tried God gave them the law. They tried to, to follow it. They couldn't make it. But you understand that, that, that God knew what it was going to take. And it wasn't a plan B thing, right? He didn't look out at what happened in the garden and went, uh, oh, no, that didn't work out. What do I do now? That's not what happened. He didn't look at the Israelites and say, well, they can't follow the law and they keep going their own way and they don't go my way and I keep warning them and, and, and you know, they go into to be enslaved, and, and then I set them free, and they still don't get it. He didn't go, oh, now what do I do? He always knew Jesus was the plan, because he's God, right? And so what does that mean? What did, what did Jesus do? 
Well, the Bible tells us that Jesus came to set the captive free. And we're the captive, right? We're, 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 we're bound by this. We're totally stuck in this. We can't do anything. Every effort we try for righteousness will not get us over there. Because we come from that, that, that corrupt viewpoint in life. And so here we are sitting in chains. So well, what did God do? Well, it wasn't too long ago that we talked about and we celebrated the birth of the Savior, right? We're not so far away from December. It may seem like months ago. It was a month ago, right? We were just celebrating the birth of our Savior a month ago. And, and if you think about this, and I always say this, and it just blows my mind because it's, it's a great picture. Think about this. The infinite God, the one that thought life and spoke it into existence. You know, Acts calls Jesus the author of life. It's about Acts 2. Jesus was always in existence. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit always existed. He's not a, he didn't get born of a man, and that was the first time we've ever heard of Jesus. Jesus is always. He's the Word. The Word became flesh. The infinite God occupied a finite space in a woman's womb. That blows me away. I don't know if it makes any sense to you. God that has no boundaries, that sits outside of time, that invented time, occupied a woman's womb and was born and lived a life. And about 30 years old, we realize that, that his ministry kind of starts at that point. We start to see you know, different things that happen to him, different small pieces of things as a child. But his ministry starts there. And what is his first thing? Well, I talked about it last week. He gets baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. Right? Heaven opens up, Holy Spirit comes down like a dove, like you get the picture of, of kind of what's happening here. He goes out after that, he gets tempted in 40 days in the wilderness. And then he comes and starts, and, and, and starts proclaiming that the kingdom of God is here. I talked about this last week, and teaching what the kingdom of God is like. And doing what? Healing every disease and casting out demons. Why? Because he's demonstrating that he's a unique king and this is a unique kingdom, that he has the power over life and death. He raises Lazarus from the dead. He has power over life and death. He's not like a pharaoh or a Caesar or a president or any king that you've ever known. He has the power over life and death. This was his ministry. And he does something in about three years. We know that his earthly ministry lasts about three years and he does something truly amazing when he comes to set the captive free, he goes to the cross to suffer a horrible, horrible death, to pay the price for us, for the sin, these chains that we can't put off by ourselves as hard as we try. He pays the price. But it doesn't stop there. He rises again on the third day. God raises him from the dead three days later. The resurrection is so important to this. It's so Important, but why? Because again, it shows again that God has the power over life and death. Jesus rises from the grave, and it's still not done yet. He comes back, and, he's, and, he, and he teaches his disciples still as he, in his risen state. And then the disciples see him ascend up to heaven, the ascension. He's, he, he goes up to heaven where he sits at the right hand of God, and he's glorified and what's amazing about this is that he's sitting there until one day when he comes back to make all things new. You get the tie in here? He's coming back to make all things new. He's not coming back to make all new things. He's coming back to make all things new. And where does he start? He starts with us. Renewing, right? This renewing of our minds, this idea that we need to be something different. And so here's the deal. God did this for us, but what did you do? What did you do? If you follow Christ, you said yes. You said yes. And what did you say yes to? Well, we get an idea in Scripture that in Romans 10 and 9 through 10 that we did a couple of things to say yes. We confessed that Jesus was Lord and we believed in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. And let me not get so calculated here, but, but understand part of this, what this is saying. Let's start with believe first. This idea of believe, that you have faith and trust and that you would do actionable things based, based on that belief. And the belief is that God has the power over life and death because if he doesn't, you do not have eternal life in heaven. If God does not have power over life and death, what's the point? Make sense? Now, when you confess that he's Lord, what you say is that I am not Lord. 
He is Lord, right? You're confessing that He is Lord. And this idea of repentance, this idea of going, when you go your own way, you go against what God is saying. When you move towards God, you are moving away from yourself and your lordship and moving towards God. This is what you do when you say yes to God. I want to go your way. It's even when you kind of dive down and you look at Romans in Romans 6 4 this idea that we're buried with him in baptism this idea that we want we should want to be buried with him why to rise again to get this new life now if if you look at the different word this is a great because here it comes again Romans 6 4 we were buried with him in baptism and death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the father we might walk in newness of life there's that parapeteo word again We get to live new life, but we're to walk in it. What a beautiful picture of what this is. And Romans 6, 22, 23 says this, You have been set free from sin and become slaves to God. The fruit of your God leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. And what most people know this verse for is, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We forget that other part of it. Like we have, we, we know this verse 23, the wages of sin and of death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. But we've been set free from sin. To what? To live a life in Jesus, right? Colossians 1, 13 for 14 really drives it home. Here's what it says. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son. When we said yes, we moved from that domain to this one, and he unhooked us. He set us free from this. And I want you to get the visual on this, and I want you to think about this for a minute. I want you to picture the person that you love the most, okay? And that you were going to some place, let's say a Caribbean island, and the natives there decided they didn't want you to vacation there, and they took your loved one captive, and they put him in a cave and locked him up in chains, And you went in and said, I'm breaking you out. You went in there and you either had the key or you had a tool and you broke the chains free and you said, come on, let's run out of here. Well, the expectation is that the person that was bound up, they would throw the chains off. They would put them away and run out with you. But what happens to us sometimes? Sometimes, yes, some of us, when we've been set free by Jesus, we throw these chains off and we run right that way. We keep moving towards the kingdom of God and we're unbound. And some of us, we're still wearing them. And sometimes we kind of look and go, well, I'm not quite sure if I, you know, I kind of like some of this stuff. It's shiny, you know, looks pretty, looks neat, right? So I'm going to keep it on for a while and we'll see how the Jesus thing goes, you know? And some of us start to walk, and we take some steps, and we're like, going, oh, man, this stuff is heavy. It's hard to walk, and I'm, I'm kind of clumsy, and I, I kind of I almost like trip and fall when I'm wearing these things. You know, this walking towards Jesus, it's not easy. And I think about, you know, like my toddler, I have a 20-month-old. Some of you, if you don't, have not seen Jubilee, you've certainly heard her, like in this service. She shouts out to Daddy a lot. But, you know, as a toddler, like, you know, she just learned to walk, and right? And so she stumbles and falls, right? And, I, and this is my fourth, right? And so if I was ever a helicopter child, it was with Kyler, who's 15. I'm telling you, I'm probably like a satellite parent now. If I was a, you know, if I was a helicopter parent, I'm definitely a satellite parent now because I think about, you know, like, we kind of let her do a lot of stuff. She trips and falls a lot. She has a desire to walk. She knows what she wants. She knows where she wants to go, and she falls down and goes bonk. And in some cases, we don't sit there like we did with Kyler and like put pillows all around him and try to make sure he didn't hurt himself. We we, we know that that she's going to trip and fall sometimes and we're going to be there to help her out. I think that's the way God pictures us, right? That idea of the refining fire that we're going to trip and fall as we walk towards Christ. We're going to have some problems. He's always going to be there to pick us up. That's a good visual, I think, of how we walk. This walk is not easy. Especially when it starts out, it feels a little clanky and hard, but I can tell you this, the more you walk this way, the easier it gets, right? The more you walk this way, my 15-year-old walks really good now. He has great posture. You know, he knows where he's going. I don't have to tell him, you know, so, okay, he's a teenager. I have to tell him a lot of things, but he, but he walks really well. That's a good thing, 
right? And as an adult, if we walked in Christ, we walk really good. And you think about what's happening here is that the more I, th- that the visual of putting off the old self, the more I take this stuff off, when I take this stuff off, what I'm saying is this domain no longer has me and I'm moving away from it, right? And so I, the more, more effort I make and walk towards this, I'm putting on Christ Jesus, the more this stuff falls away, right? It no longer hangs on to me. And if he even tries to draw me back, which is what the devil wants to do, he wants to draw you back into that domain, is always trying to pull you back in. But the more, we, more effort we make here, the more chain comes off. But we have to make that effort, right? We have to, to turn that in. And what's the beautiful picture, if you didn't miss it, right? You missed the, the, the idea of the armor. Think about how this works. When I start putting on Jesus, when I start putting on the armor, the stuff of that kingdom starts to bounce off of me because Jesus has got my back. Right? I don't even have to be drugged. I don't even have to look back over my shoulder. What I, as I move forward, the armor of God is, 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 is protecting me as I move closer to this until all these chains are off. This is where I end up. My walk puts me at the feet of Jesus at his throne. These chains are fully off because I have done the effort that Jesus called me to do to make steps towards him, to walk with him, to walk towards him, to put off the old self and to put on the new, which is him. It's an unmistakable picture that the Bible gives us about what this is, that, that we have to, to decide that we no longer want to be bound by the domain of darkness, by the devil who wants to keep you here. He wants to, he wants to, he wants to keep you so bound up that you'll still wear those chains that every once in a while you go, hey, Jesus, how you doing? Way out here. If he can keep you far away from God, yes, you may be in this kingdom. You may be in the kingdom of light. The more he can keep you away from God, the more that he ruins your testimony to the person around you. The, the light that you're supposed to be, that you shine around, is very dull sitting here on the edge of the kingdom bound in chains. But there's so good news in that is that he comes and he, and he absolutely, absolutely comes to set us free. He, he did not have a plan that you would still wear these. But he knew that you still might. So the teaching of this says throw this stuff off, put me on, walk in my ways. Unmistakable, that view. And so now what is what we're kind of at right now. It's like, what do you do with this? Well, think about this illustration. Everybody is somewhere in this illustration. There are people that may be sitting over here that have not accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. There are people that may sit in this place. And here's the good news about this is Jesus came for these people. This was you and me and everybody else. He comes here. This is why he comes to set the captive free. He didn't come for the religious leaders and the Pharisees. He gave them a pretty good talking to if you read your Bible. He came for these people to move them into this kingdom, and he doesn't want you bound in chains from this kingdom. He wants you to throw them fully off, but he knows to do this that you'll have to keep making efforts to know him better, to have a relationship with him, to grow in him, for the Holy Spirit to teach you, to sanctify you, to change all those things inside of you so that all those chains will get thrown off and you end up right at the feet of Jesus, the best place to possibly be. This is what we're called. And so when we come this time of, of communion and reflection and invitation, I just want to, and to invite you to this. One, if, you're, if, if you think you have not been transferred to this kingdom, we would be glad to talk to you about that and what that means and pray with you. Maybe today's the day that you've been granted, that you get granted access to the, granted access to the kingdom of God. And if you're somewhere on here, and Travis talked about this in offering, that here's what the church is here for. We're here as the body of Christ, and we've been gifted to do different things to help us grow in Christ, to learn more about Him, to walk more towards Him, that we would make every effort to do that so that we can be fully set free, that we're fully moving towards Him without any burden that we're still carrying because we like the shiny of the metal. Or that we're so bound by Satan that we still have to do things that we don't really want to do. We want to move this way. Let's figure out how to move. 
And then the last piece is part of communion. I think this is great, such a great picture of communion. You know, Jesus comes, we talk about it every week. And his body was broken on the cross and his blood was shed for us, right? We talk about that every week when we go in and we share communion time. And what a beautiful picture. But this idea that, that, that he did this, that the infinite God came to a finite world and walked with us in flesh and died a painful death and then rose again and said, look, you know, this is it, guys. I have the power over life and death. And when you come to me and you accept this gift, when you, when you call on me as Lord and Savior, when you say, yes, I have you, but I expect you to walk. So this time of communion, I want you to, to, to really search your heart. Talk to Jesus. What are the things you need to put off and what are the things that he can help you grow in him to put on him and get that armor and to live a life that he's called you to? This is the abundant life he's called you to, a kingdom life. Why? Because he's preparing people for eternity in a kingdom. It's a beautiful picture. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for truth. I thank you for your great love for us. I thank you for showing us a way. I thank you for making a way for us that when we're bound by chains, the only freedom we get is in Jesus Christ. Lord, just show us more of you, that we may grow in you, that we may live a life worthy, that you've called us to this life as kingdom people, and that we will know more about you and know you more, that we would walk in your ways. Lord, in this time of communion, bless us in this time. Speak to our hearts. Renew our minds. Transform us as we come together in worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stations around the front and the back. If you need to talk to anybody or pray it over, we'll be up here.